Hey, Vlad here, DevonsID.com. Welcome to another video. I wanted to make a video about IDEs and my original plan was to stay as objective as possible and compare them feature by feature and whatnot. However, since I truly believe that we humans don't make our decisions based on logic alone, I changed my mind. And so instead of going for an objective video, I decided to share with you my subjective and highly biased opinion. I believe that this way it will be more valuable to you, even though it will end up being more polarizing and therefore will be naturally disliked by some of you, which I don't mind, go for it. What I also figured was that instead of throwing a bunch of biases at you, I would like you to understand where my biases come from. And so this video that I was just describing is not this one, it's gonna be the next. This one, on the other hand, is going to be simply the story Story of all the IDEs and editors which I used or maybe considered using in my over 10 year programming journey. And since you're still here, let's get right to it. I started creating videos over two years ago and in my very first video I said that I got interested in programming because I was playing video games, which is a very common path for programmers by the way, even though by far not all programmers play video games. The game that we were playing back in the day was Counter-Strike and even though it still exists I don't find myself playing it much these days. Anyways, back then I didn't even have my own computer and yes, I'm much older than I look. But anyways, even if I did, online gaming was not a thing back then. Instead we would go to game houses and if you're not familiar with those, it's basically a room with a bunch of computers in there. It's basically like an internet cafe but for games and they still exist primarily in Asian countries. In any case, why does this matter? Why am I telling you all of this? Well, the thing is that if you play Counter-Strike for a longer period of time, you're going to find yourself in a situation where you want to change the game settings a little bit. It and you know customize the key bindings and whatnot and it turns out that this takes forever and also you might find yourself in a situation where you have to do this over and over again because the player who used the computer before you changed the defaults as well none of this is a big deal these days these days you don't even have to buy the game in a store you just download it and you know you go through the settings once or twice and then you're good to go but if you're going to a game house the computer is not yours so the next time you come all your settings might be gone fortunately counter-strike made it possible to put all of your settings into the so-called config file and then you could bring it on a USB stick, plug it in and make Counter-Strike load all of your settings. What's even better, if you're lucky to use the same computer as you used the last time, your config might still be there and so if the player who used the computer before you change some settings, you can still just load your config and so over time your config spreads all over the computers like a little virus, which is kind of funny. <laughs> Since Windows was the king of gaming back in the day, and it still is, let's be honest, the first IDE that I used to write my config file was, well, you guessed it, Notepad. And by the way, as already mentioned, we're not going to discuss any IDEs or editors in here. We're going to do this in the next video. This is just a story of what I have used so far. All right, so this was all the quote-unquote programming that I did before I went to the university, in which in the first semester they taught us C. In fact, it was a weird mixture of C and C++. There was no object orientation or anything like that, but the libraries that we were using, some of them were from C and some of them were from C++. For instance, uh, when they taught us how to print stuff out, we were using C out, and I only learned about printf much, much later. Now our professors strongly advised us not to use any IDEs at all because the thing was that in the exam there would be no computers and we would be forced to write C code without you know syntax highlighting or anything like that. So my second IDE was a piece of paper and if I remember correctly they told us that they wouldn't accept an answer written with a pencil so it was a piece of paper and a pen. Now I'm not sure what sadistic beliefs drove this decision making but hey you can't fight the city hall. Now, next to the lectures, we had some work-like practice sessions. These were assignments in the form of small programs that had to be written and shown to our tutors who were students from higher semesters. For this, a program written on a piece of paper was not enough. The tutors wanted to see a program that was running. And so in the beginning, we started with Notepad, but then we quickly discovered Notepad++, which had syntax highlighting. But again, syntax highlighting was a two-edged sword. Even though they would help us track down those pesky semicolons, during the exam, we wouldn't have Notepad++ to help us, so choose wisely. Now, after a few weeks of that, we got cocky. We were real programmers now, so we got tired of writing the code and then switching back to the terminal to compile it and link it and whatnot, and then run it and then see the arrows, and then this constant jumping around between the editor and console was annoying. We wanted better tools, and so we started using a very minimalistic IDE called I don't remember how it's called. It was 12 years ago, but it was something similar to Def C++ or whatever it's called. It actually might have been it, but I really honestly just don't remember. In fact, I asked a few fellow students of mine and they don't remember either. <laughs> now let's switch to the second semester in which they taught us Java. Same deal though, no computers during the exam. 
What was different though was this whole object orientation deal. And I'm simply mentioning it here because the assignments that we were receiving were not focused on algorithms anymore. So whereas in the first semester where we were traversing virtual chessboards in C, in the second semester we were creating interfaces for radios and whatnot. And so our programs, even though they weren't really bigger, they appeared to be bigger and so we needed a bigger boat, something that could at least jump between two files quickly. There were two choices at the time, NetBeans and Eclipse, and for some reason most of us gravitated towards Eclipse. I actually don't know why, probably because our professors recommended it. Back then IntelliJ didn't have a community edition and so most of us didn't even know that it existed. In the third semester some of us, including this guy, participated in an optional lecture about C Sharp and the rest of the .NET world. And so the time came for the grand Visual Studio. Not Visual Studio Code though, that's a different thing. By the end of the third semester, my c -sharp professor, whom I really liked and respected, and he also happened to be my Java and databases professor, told me that he stumbled on this pretty new and really cool language called Scala, and he was planning to create an entire lecture about it in the next semester, and he was convinced that I would really like it, and boy, was that an underestimation. By the way, let me pause real quick and explain to you how much I liked and respected this professor and I actually wasn't alone. There was this lecture called Algorithms and Data Structures and it was an important one, so it was really important to me to understand it. And there were two professors who were teaching it, my favorite one and some other guy. And so my favorite one was teaching one semester and the other guy was teaching the next semester and so on. And so as with most lotteries, we didn't win. And so in our semester, it was this other guy. And you know, I passed the exam with flying colors, but then I didn't really feel like I understood the concepts. You know, it's a different thing actually understanding things and passing the exam. And so in the next semester when my favorite professor was teaching that, I actually went there again, even though I didn't have to pass an exam. And even though it was in the winter and it even was it was the first lecture on a Friday and the first lecture starts at 7.30. And that is how much I liked him. Oh, and by the way, since most of you are scholar devs, this professor of mine was writing a book back then when we were studying, and so we helped him out to review it, and nobody's paying me to say this, but the book is on Amazon, and it's called Grundkurs Funktionale Programmierung in Scala, written by my favorite professor of all time called Lothar Piepmeier. And the, yes, the book is in German. I'm sorry, all I can do for you is translate the title, which says Introductory Course to Functional Programming in Scala, and the link is going to be down in the description. Back to the story. And so it was Scala time, and let me tell you, you have not experienced real pain in life if you haven't used Scala 2.7 with Eclipse around the year 2009. Long story short, everything is underlined red, nothing works, and I kid you not, this is the most accurate description that you're gonna get. Now the fifth semester was interesting because it was an internship semester and back then there was no point in trying to find a Scala position and so I was looking for Java, but I found a better offer for C Sharp instead and so we were back with Visual Studio. And I'm not mentioning this simply to entertain the idea of keeping the timeline intact. I was quote unquote in the industry at the time and so shit just got real. And what that meant was that my employer had some big bucks laying around to spend on some fancy licensing. Since this was a .NET shop and everyone was doing C Sharp and Visual Studio, every one of them had this interesting plugin installed called ReSharper. And let me tell you, life is too short to write C Sharp without ReSharper. It was so freaking awesome. I don't know what it does today, but back then, which is which was around like, I don't know, eight years ago or so, it was a very sick linter with insane refactoring capabilities. I mean, shit was crazy. The coding session with ReSharper would look something like this. You write some code and then ReSharper looks at it and says, hey, what's, what's going on over there? It looks like you have two levels of nested while loops. Uh, would you like me to rewrite this into a language integrated query syntax? But you know, no pressure. And after staring at your code for a bit, you'd go, well, damn, yes, please. And it would do it and it would work. And you have to understand that this was right after me coming from this wall of red, which was Eclipse for Scala back in the day. Now, after the internship, I was going back to the poor student world and also back to the Java world, but not all hope was lost. See, apparently JetBrains, the company that was behind the Sharper, also had an Eclipse plugin for Java called IntelliJ IDEA. And you can imagine my surprise when I found out that it was not a plugin, but a full-blown IDE instead. Also, by that time, I knew who Uncle Bob Martin was, and since this was the beginning of the golden age of video creation, I knew which IDE he was using. And what was it? IntelliJ IDEA. And so I got excited to start playing around with it, but then I realized that they didn't have a community edition, and since, as I already mentioned, I was a poor student, Eclipse it was. 
After this, I wrote my bachelor's thesis in Eclipse with some LaTeX plugin. During my master's, which was at a different university, just FYI, the Play framework was starting to get big in the Scala ecosystem. I didn't know much about frontend at the time, and after watching a few video tutorials, I saw this beautiful editor that people were using called Sublime Text, version 2 at the time. As you might have seen in my previous videos, Sublime Text is not a full-blown IDE, it is just an editor similar to Notepad++, which is a very common theme among front-end developers. All the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are scripted dynamic languages, and since there is no AST behind them, an IDE doesn't have much to offer, and so the focus of front-end developers lies somewhere else, and more about that in the next video. And so I started playing with Sublime, and I would like to stress the word plain, because to this day Sublime remains a proprietary software, but you can evaluate it as long as you want. And since I was a student, I think I was playing with it for, for a year or even longer before I finally bought the license. To this day, Sublime remains my default editor. I use it all the time. In fact, I have written the script for this very video in Sublime Text. I even write emails sometimes in Sublime, and it's also my default editor when I want to open, you know, XML file or, you know, any text file, anything like that. It's, it's set up as my default editor in all the operating systems that I'm using. These days, IntelliJ IDEA is a popular choice for Scala, and I use it as well, even though I don't really like it. Also, much more interesting things like build and language server protocols are popping up these days with tools like Enzyme, SPT Server, and Bloop and Metals, which I use as well, and in fact, I'm gonna make a video about it very soon. But mainly, I stick to Sublime, and I use IntelliJ when I really, really need some heavy IDE features. Sublime Text has been dominating the front-end world for quite some time, and it was only a matter of time until someone created another editor inspired by it, and this editor was Atom, and it was created by GitHub. Only a short time later, another competitor popped up with Visual Studio Code, created by none other than Microsoft. A while after that, Microsoft actually bought GitHub, and even though no one pulled the plug on Atom just yet, the chances of that happening are really high. Visual Studio Code is a serious player, and by the way, did you notice that Microsoft is making headlines in the world of open source these days? The sudden interest in GitHub, this whole subsystem for Linux, and also they're on some Linux board, and they're working on this new fancy terminal for Windows, and let's not forget TypeScript, which is conquering the front-end world. I mean, damn! Call me impressed. So I find myself slowly transitioning to Visual Studio Code, even though my heart belongs to Sublime Text and I still find it visually more pleasing. Somewhere in the middle of the story, I told myself a few basic Vim commands, which is enough to SSH into a box and edit a few files, but I never actually took the time to learn it properly. Another editor that I want to mention that really got my hopes up back in the day was Lighttable. It popped up on one of these crowdfunding sites back in the day when they were just starting. And as I said, it really got my hopes up because it looked, um, you know, very much different. But then it took some time until, you know, they actually released it and it kind of uh, fell off my radar. And uh, so I haven't even installed it for, for the preparation of this video. Uh, but I highly recommend that you guys check it out because it's um, it's conceptually, you know, something new for, for the first time in a, in a, in a long time. So so it's still, you know, it's still out there. It's still, you know, it's still kicking, doing its own thing. It's targeting primarily, you know, the front-end developers. But yeah, check it out. It's called Lighttable, and I'm going to leave the link down in the description. All right, so to recap, I've seen quite a few editors, not too many, but also not too few. These days, most of the time, I use Sublime Text, even though I find myself slowly transitioning into Visual Studio Code. And occasionally, when I you know, when I feel the need for heavier weaponry, I spin up IntelliJ for some nasty debugging session. In the next video, we will talk about my biases and the reasons for my choices. And please don't forget that I'm going to make it very subjective on purpose. In fact, it's going to end up being a little bit ranty towards the end. I really believe that it's going to be more valuable to you this way because I really don't believe that it makes sense to compare them feature for feature because I don't believe that we choose our, our IDs, our tools, or, you know, in general, make our decisions uh, based on logic alone. All right. As always, it's been Vlad, DevInsideU.com. Don't forget to like this video if you did. Subscribe if you want to improve the developer inside you. And if you find my videos valuable, consider supporting me on Patreon. But most importantly, take care.